morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. You're all welcome to the AGHPF webinar session, and it's a pleasure to have you with us. I hope this session will be beneficial to each one of you. My name is Sarah Biabazaire, and I'm part of the AGHPF team. Today's webinar session is a reflection on the progress that Uganda has made in strengthening laboratory systems. Representatives from Ministry of Health, CDC, and labs in Uganda will be sharing their perspective on the journey towards quality improvement. As AGHPF, we take this opportunity to recognize the stakeholders that have made a meaningful contribution towards quality improvement. We thank the Ministry of Health for accepting this program and allowing AGHPF to work with them through the Uganda National Health Laboratory Services, UNHLS, to support the labs across the country. We thank UNHLS under the leadership of Dr. Susan Nabada for the support and dedication to improving laboratory services in Uganda. The milestones attained are a result of your hard work. And for that, we thank you and your team. The laboratories that we worked with are located in different regions and districts across the country. In a special way, we thank the regional and district leadership for allowing us to work with their team. We also appreciate the support the regional and district leadership has given to the facilities and the teams in the labs. We appreciate the facility and lab management team for the stewardship and for the direction that they give the lab units. Your leadership is the reason continuous quality improvements have become a reality in Uganda. And for that, we thank you. To the system implementers in the lab, we would like to say a big thank you for the sacrifices you make in terms of time, the dedication and investment made towards improving laboratory systems and services. <clears throat> Excuse me. The services, uh, improving the services offered to the people that you serve in the different localities. We thank you and we pray that you will keep it up. We would also like to take this time just to um, appreciate and thank the implementing partners for the excellent collaboration that we have had. Each of the milestones recorded would never have been possible without your support. And for that, we thank you. The improvements recorded in the lab sector would never have been possible. Would never have been possible without funds. In a very, very special way, we'd like to thank the US government through CDC for the funds that were earmarked for this program and the support given. We would also like to thank the other US agencies like USID and DOD for the support that they have accorded the program. Finally, I would like to express my gratitude to the AGHPF team for the work that they have done in enabling the success of this program. Thank you and thank you to our leader, Professor Kilian Songwe, for the guidance and direction that you have given the team. Today, we pass the baton on to Joint Clinical Research Center. We wish you the very best and ask that everybody accords them the necessary support that they will require. Without any further ado, I'd like to invite the Regional Director and President of AGHPF, Professor Kilian Songwe, to take us through the journey and key milestones recorded during the life of this program. Thank you, and over to you, Professor Kilian. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening. Uh, it's certainly a deep pleasure uh, to be with you this afternoon. Uh, Sarah, I could not be more thankful. I don't think I would have done an opening any better than you did. Uh, that was phenomenal. Thank you. Uh, this is indeed great. I am happy to have everybody here today. And uh, as we go through this, uh, basically, uh, we just want to take you through some of the things that we've done in Uganda in the last uh, couple of years. Again, uh, it's technical assistance for strengthening national laboratory systems in Uganda. It's the assignment uh, that we had about five years ago. And this picture is most probably one of the most heartwarming things that uh, 
I always think about when I think about uh, the work we've done in strengthening lab systems in Uganda. Uh, it's the real partnership of the leadership, uh, the staff and the team here at the Global Healthcare, the partners as well, are coming together to ensure that it all happens. As we go through this, uh, give you a quick background, talk about some of the objectives. Sorry. They're not seeing the presentation. Okay, I thought that was taken through. I'm sorry, I, I just found out that you're not seeing my slides. Okay. I hope you can see my slides now. I just got told you couldn't see my slides. Uh, well, I was talking about this picture. I think this is the picture I referred to when I spoke about uh, all the partners coming together for success. And uh, what we're going to achieve today, uh, a word or two about the background, uh, the objectives, the achievements that were made during uh, the project. Uh, I think we, the challenges and then some big acknowledgement, but just uh, to be able to start out, uh, one or two things about the Global Healthcare Public Foundation. Uh, we've been around the globe for almost the last 18 years now, and uh, with a big team and uh, done a lot of collaborations. At least we have operations in 16 different countries, offices in five of them. And uh, we're really excited to be doing uh, systems management, which is really what we do our consultancies in. Coming to Uganda, uh, just for my friends and colleagues who are out of the continent, uh, that is where Uganda is located on the continent uh, with a population. Uh, this is from uh, the Uganda Bureau of Statistics Census of 2019-2020, a population of just uh, a little over 4 million people. And because we're talking about healthcare, what is of great interest to most people at this point now is uh, what is going on with HIV. 54% uh, of the population knows something about HIV. Prevalence in the country, I guess, is 5.4. 82% uh, 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 viral suppression already exists in the country, which is pretty important. So background to the project we're working on, uh, technical assistance for strengthening national laboratory systems in Uganda under the president's uh, emergency uh, plan for AIDS uh, relief. We had a number, the project ran from April of 2016 uh, to just yesterday. We had a number of objectives. Uh, key of them, uh, number one actually was to ensure the uh, legalization and change of status autonomy of UNHLS uh, to use uh, the SLAMTA program and the SLIPTA tool to strengthen the laboratories. Uh, to improve the standards uh, implementation in the country. Uh, very important as well was to work around issues of national external quality assessment schemes in the country, uh, strengthen the equipment and biosafety cabinet maintenance across the country as well. And then look into waste management and the whole area of bio-risk management. So these were the things that we actually uh, worked on. A couple of them changed across the years. Uh, some for a shorter period and some for a much longer period. But if we looked at SLAMTA, uh, originally there are 100 hubs, laboratory hubs across the country. We met 100 hubs in the country. And the, the SLAMTA program was already in existence uh, before April of 2016. But basically what a global healthcare did with the SLAMTA program was we moved the SLAMTA program into what we later on called SLAMTA Supplemental. And basically what we did with the SLAMTA Supplemental was actually bringing some very key parts, which I'm going to talk about later. That was bringing the models, the international standard ISO 5189 and the 12 QSEs together and roll them up into one additional training. What was also key in making sure that there was success in the program was actually the invitation of senior management. The top management of the facilities became a part and parcel of everything that happened in Slamta. So talking about the SLAPTA supplementary, which was really key in terms of uh, changing the nature of the playing field and developing the labs, the SLAMTA program existed. So we didn't invent the SLAMTA program. Uh, the QSEs existed. We did not invent the QSEs. The SLAMTA models, 
uh, uh, module one through module 10 were actually a part of the program. And the ISO 5189 as well, we didn't do anything about inventing it. But what we did to bring the SLAMTA supplemental was we actually spent the energy, the time and the effort to associate the quality systems essentials with the specific associated models and the specific associated SLAMTA clauses. So in this case, just for the purpose of the conversation, and SLAMTA one, one of the first things that you look at is structure of documents. That would be QSE one, two, and three in terms of document and records management. But then the model within the SLAMTA program that actually addressed that is actually module one, six, and 10. So we changed the traditional uh, SLAMTA delivery of coming to SLAMTA one and then uh, module one, two, three, and then SLAMTA two, four, five, six. And we associated this with the related clauses in the standard that would actually tie this. So there was immediate understanding and appreciation of what the standard required, what the model was intended to achieve, and how the QSEs, in essence, allowed the different labs to be able to progress. Of course, then there is this slide, which is the actual awarding of uh, an ASLM uh, uh, certificate uh, to one of the labs. And this is a very important slide because uh, at the beginning, the use of the WHO slipper checklist was what was used to actually assess uh, the compliance of these labs with regards to their actual implementation and documentation of their system. And the way, yeah, there are actually two very important milestones here. There is, first of all, a national audit, which is actually done in country uh, we help build capacity for national auditors and SLAMTA auditors. And then there is the ASLM audit. The national audit actually precedes the ASLM audit because it actually is able to, to root out the labs that are going to be presented to ASLM for, for audits and then awards of a certificate. And that's what you see in this particular uh, picture here. In terms of impact, I think one of the most important thing that we noted is uh, at the beginning when in 2016, 2015, 2016, is the labs actually hovered for the most part uh, between zero stars and one star. But when you think about the addition of bringing in the standard and relating the standard directly uh, with the QSEs and the models, uh, what we were able to do in great collaboration with uh, our colleagues out at uh, the UNHLS and the training teams out there, uh, we're able to now move over the last four years. Star zero, you actually see what happened at the baseline. We had 17 plus labs at star zero and star one, and that tremendously shifted. So what we leave today is a bunch of labs that have actually moved from star zero and, uh, and one into star three and star four. Star three is actually a very important decision point in terms of taking labs to accreditation. So what we have here is we have a lot of low hundred foot labs that are ready to be on the accreditation pipeline uh, and then increase the number of labs in the country that have been accredited. So going on to accreditation, I remember very vividly uh, when we started in April and uh, or when I got the notice of award uh, and we replied to the weaknesses and strengths like every one of us out there does when you get a notice of award. Uh, one of the things we said in our notice of award was that we were going to actually accredit, have seven labs accredited over the course of the, of the project. And uh, on the field, we had 16 labs that the ministry had selected. Uh, 15, 11 of them came to a global healthcare and five of them went to the East African Public Health Laboratory Network. So what you have here, and I'm just using this as a point of emphasis, when you move from the SLAMTA program where the element of recognition was the star level, you get into the accreditation program where the element of recognition in terms of uh, what is going on is actually the number of non-conformities. Malme, Kayonga, and Kiriandongo were some of the earlier labs we started working. M stands for management, T stands for technical. When we look at the number of non-conformities that these labs had on day one at their baseline uh, audits, uh, Malme had about 77 non-conformities, Kayonga had 121 non-conformities, and Kiriandongo had 
almost 139 nonconformities. This is on day one when we started the project. With the addition of the things we did in Slamta and the knowledge that we have for steering laboratories towards accreditation, in nine months, we're able to move the 77 non-conformities from Malme or the 121 from Kayonga or the 139 from Kiriandongo into 13 on the date of the assessment, four for Kayonga on the day of the assessment and three for Kiriandongo. And I must really, really emphasize at this point uh, that all the credit goes to the people in the lab and the management teams at this facility. And it's the same for all the accredited labs that we work with. As soon as they appreciated the management review, as soon as they appreciated uh, evaluations, performance evaluations, and we're able to buy in into the program, a lot of these changes move. So uh, I remember at the beginning of the slam club program, uh, people would fight uh, to be able to get uh, points because you needed to have at least 187 points to have a high star level. On the contrary, in the accreditation program, you want to be able to have fewer non-conformities so that your process to the accreditation certificate is actually easier. So how did we do it? Uh, you go past the audits and the presentation to assessments. There were other things that happened in the middle. Uh, mentorships, uh, each of our accredited labs uh, had at least nine cycles of uh, mentorships, which was actually a residency program combined with an online program. So we would, were able to reach them online. And uh, there's some milestone achievements that we made with the break of COVID, which I would address. Uh, all our mentorships were tied with core trainings. We, we identified uh, six core trainings that were required to actually move a lab to accreditation. And the big difference here between the accreditation program and the SLAMTA program is actually the implementation and competence that is required in accreditation versus the documentation and compliance uh, that is the cornerstone for the SLAMTA program. Uh, this is Kiriandongo's uh, certificate and uh, we're so pleased with Kiriandongo. We've never had such uh, uh, support from all levels, from district level, lab level, hospital management. Uh, it's been phenomenal. We're so proud of uh, the work. Same as we are for all the other labs, but we always speak Kiriandongo because it's one of the first ones that we actually took down the road. Uh, talking about the trainings, uh, the, the first and most important training is what we call the, what is called the systems course. And that's the ISO 5189. This is a paramount part of ensuring that the labs are successful at the accreditation assessment uh, when they come. In the country of Uganda, the Ministry of Health uh, made the decision much earlier on that uh, the uh, South African national accreditation system would be the accrediting body uh, for its medical laboratories. Uh, suffice for me to add that uh, SANAS is the oldest accrediting body on the continent, 20 plus years, and so very reputable, very, very uh, strong in the work that they do in the area of medicals. And so it was a great decision uh, to have picked them. And I'm SANAS people on the line or anybody else, I'm not doing any marketing for SANAS, please, I'm not. I'm just saying what they are. Uh, back to the trainings, um, corrective action, big pet one of the things uh, that really moved the pin, if you want to gauge, was management review. Uh, when the management review training was done, uh, we got in the, man the top management, not only of the hospital, but of the district. So especially the cows. The cows were very instrumental in being able to understand new allocation and resources to some of these facilities. And this is in light of the fact that the implementing partners are already doing as much as they have to do. Uh, but again, it is really crucial for the districts and the managed local government to appreciate what is going on and plan for a total takeover at some day. Statistical process control, very key in making sure that uh, you can actually appreciate what is going on with the technical results that actually get uh, gotten from the test. And then of course, assessment techniques. Uh, everybody prepares for an exam at one day or another. But you always need a refresher, you need a brief, you need a, a cleanup uh, before you actually take the exam. And the assessment techniques were very important in preparing the labs uh, for this assessment. So, 
some of the key impact from the accreditation process, the slam plan accreditation process is coming together. Uh, besides the fact that uh, uh, SANAS now rates uh, Uganda, SANAS rates Uganda as having the highest number of accredited labs out of South Africa. And I think that's really important to note. It's really important to note. This is international comparisons. And that's how far, uh, uh, if you're going to go with the best, that's how far the best has done with us. Readiness uh, and competencies for laboratories to decentralize uh, testing during uh, COVID-19. This was done in Uganda very seamlessly. And why was it done so seamlessly? We had a hundred hubs at the beginning. We have 85% of the labs in star three and above. We have almost 37 labs accredited in this country. Uh, yes, about 16 or 17 under a global healthcare, but there are more labs accredited in the country because there is a lot, a lot of knowledge that is now available on understanding the standard and understanding the competencies and knowledge required to take the labs through that. So uh, just to be able to highlight the labs, because we're talking about these labs as if to say they don't exist, uh, just to be able to see the labs. I think what is really important to me on this slide, yes, the labs are important, the departments that are accredited are important, but my challenge to the labs, my challenge to the labs is we look at the number of uh, tests that are accredited. Uh, you look at Hoima, Hoima has four tests that are accredited in immun immunology, serology, and microbiology. The challenge today is how do we move this number of accredited tests up? Uh, we have uh, Pope John, uh, the 23rd, has seven uh, uh, tests that are accredited. The most important thing to recognize is once you've gone through the assessment the first time, all we, that has to happen now is the building of capacity. So four labs have been presented, seven labs have been presented. How do we make them five, seven, and eight? So we have, uh, we have uh, St. Francis. I'm sorry, St. Francis, that I call you St. Ralph. This is St. Francis uh, Hospital, uh, and this is uh, Mile Maid. They have 16 and 24 tests that are actually accredited and more disciplines than most of the other uh, labs. These are private not-for-profit labs. Uh, but then there is Uganda Matters and uh, Kisubi, uh, which are going to be presented in less than another 22 days from today. Uh, with, uh, Uganda Matters has four, uh, 14 tests that will be presented in uh, serology, microbiology, molecular biology, hematology, and Kisubi. The reason why I have uh, 11, 12, 13, and 14 highlighted is because if you look at their date of initial accreditation uh, or initial assessment, May of 2018, uh, the accreditation cycle is four years. So this is really important. And uh, I wish people could uh, just hit on the clap button and, and uh, clap for this lab because they've actually gone through four cycles of surveillance assessment. And as they've gone through the four cycles of surveillance assessments, they've actually also increased their scope test. I think that is phenomenal. And I think uh, they should be exemplary uh, to the rest of the labs who have not yet gone for accreditation. And those who have gone for accreditation and want to increase their, uh, their scope test. So uh, I see the clubs coming up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I like that, I like that. I hope uh, all the lab members are, are seeing the, the, the applause for them. Uh, that's wonderful. But yes, it's important to note that these labs have sustained accreditation. They've gone through four cycles. Uh, they are getting ready now to start a whole new uh, cycle of four. So they'll be going into their eighth rotation. In position number 18, this is not a traditional medical lab. This is the National Equipment Calibration Laboratory. Uh, this is a very big plus to the country of Uganda. This is a very big plus. Uh, they have uh, 12 uh, elements that are in their scope, and we're going to be looking at them when we come down to equipment and calibration. They initially started with six, and over uh, the last year, as they've gone through their, their first cycle of surveillance, they've actually added another six. That's what gets them to 12. And this is important to note. Once you've been accredited once, the process of adding to your scope test becomes so simple because you know what is required. You know, 
to, to put it in layman's language, you know the game. And if you know the game, it's easy to play. So on the standards, uh, this was one of the things uh, we contributed to uh, in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, one of the big ones is the national test menu. Uh, the national test menu uh, policy, we work, help work in that area, uh, point of care testing, and I wouldn't bore you with the language and the rationale. Uh, suffice it to say that they were completed and they are actually active today. Uh, the draft uh, National External Quality uh, Assurance Guidelines also worked on. Uh, National Laboratory Sector Policy. Uh, the only one that is actually pending uh, is the Waste Management Policy. Uh, that guide uh, is still being reviewed. But this is work that was just done in the last few months. Uh, this is work that was done actually uh, just at the dawn of COVID or right in the middle of COVID. So talking about the calibration laboratory, this is a great bravo. It's a great bravo uh, to the country of Uganda uh, to be able to have the uh, National Equipment Calibration Lab come to the level of accreditation because suddenly, suddenly there is so much money that stays in country. But at the same time, uh, there is a lot of the equipments that actually are brought to utility in a shorter time. So the calibration lab actually started its journey in 2016 with uh, funding from, CP, uh, from CDC under IHA, the American uh, International Health Alliance. And then we only jumped in at the tail end uh, to be able to help polish them for uh, the accreditation process, uh, which we did. They finally got accredited in 2020. And now after accreditation, they have what I call authority. They have the authority to be able to reach out to the regional workshops. Uh, they have the authority to be able to do calibration and regional workshops, which in turn can be used at the district level because the most important element that the National Equipment Calibration Lab brings to the game of the entire lab strengthening is the element of traceability. The element of traceability is very important uh, in the whole diagnostic medicine. And the National Equipment Calibration Lab brings that uh, to bear with its ability to be able to reach out to the regional uh, workshops and in turn for the regional workshops to be able to cascade down to the districts and uh, the uh, health centers for that down. So today, lab maintenance in uh, Uganda, around everything that deals with diagnostic medicine is done by the National Equipment Calibration Lab. I know uh, Mutaka is listening and he's watching, and I know you want me to ask people to clap for you, and so I'm going to do that as well. So please, guys, clap for what is going on at the National Equipment Calibration Lab. I think it's phenomenal what they're doing. I think it's great. Uh, this is what the scope looked like at the beginning. Uh, every lab that I know has a centrifuge, and you need a tachometer to be able to calibrate your centrifuge. Uh, the original scope on day one was temperature, mass, uh, F1 weights generally, these are for lower, these are for labs that are actually going to use them themselves and support other labs. Uh, they had volumes, but imagine that when they began, uh, they were calibrated and accredited to do single channel uh, pipettes. And if you're going to do uh, COVID testing on a 96 world plate, just imagine how many times you're going to be pipetting and the amount of work that is required to do that. Of course, the tachometer for speed and time. And uh, what has up actually added since they went through their first surveillance, because they were initially accredited and then they've gone through a surveillance and then they were able to add. And I put the gauges there because I don't know that there is anybody still living on this earth who hasn't seen this thermometer gone. Or oh, we should be saying welcome to Jerusalem here. So what added? The infrared temperature, used at all our points of entry, uh, not just as you go into the supermarket or you go into any uh, government building or any building, but points of entry, I'm looking at all the points of entry around the country, the, uh, all the border points, uh, pressure, humidity, very important things that they have actually added. But number 12 is also key, especially in the day and age in which we live. Uh, they, are, they now have multi-channel pipette calibration. That is very, very important and really significant to the work that they do. Then, of course, huge impact to have had the National Equipment Calibration Lab. Uh, 
when uh, COVID broke in March of 2020, uh, back in the day, all the uh, biosafety cabinets had to be certified. Uh, WHO said uh, all the samples should be received on a BS2. And uh, in Uganda, there was the National Equilibrium Calibration Lab ready and available. 100% of all the labs that needed calibration were calibrated in a very short space of time. People were deployed, they were out, they had instruments, they had the technology, they had the technical know-how, the competence was available and it was done. And testing was ready to go. In terms of dollars, uh, dollars is a really important thing to me. Uh, if it's not important to you, wave and uh, I'll know where to go for my next loan. Uh, but dollars were important to the National Equipment Calibration Lab. And this is what they have done uh, by being uh, uh, accredited. They've saved at least 350 United States dollars that would have gone outside to another calibration company uh, had they not been accredited. Uh, support to all the labs that are in the SLAMTA program in terms of ensuring that their, their small equipments are being calibrated. Uh, support to IPC, GHS, and uh, the AMR programs. 90% of all biosafety uh, cabinets in the country are calibrated. That's a big plus. Over 50% of all the autocloves and work is still going on, and that is really important. At regional referral hospital laboratories are as well all calibrated. Uh, very big. Without this slide and without this activity, all the accredited labs, 37 of them in the country, none of them would be accredited. Interlaboratory comparison is the cornerstone to laboratory competence. It's the cornerstone to laboratory competence. This allows for an outside lab, a third party lab, an agency uh, to be able to ascertain that the work that is done is actually of some kind of quality. And uh, I put this clause, this is straight out of the ISO 5189, the 2012 standard 5.6.3. It talks about comparability of examination results, external quality assessment program, and the proficiency uh, testing program, uh, which actually brings to bear three very important things. One, there has to be a documented procedure. All our labs, accredited labs, labs in the SLAM Club program, all have a documented procedure that talks about how they are going to go through interlaboratory comparison. Doing and participating in EQA is, does not suffice. What is important? is A, that you participate, and B, that there is corrective action done. Because when we get to C, which looks at peer group uh, of laboratories, you're actually competing with the rest of your friends on the same platforms. It's not on the same department. So it's not about uh, hematology. It's about what equipment you're using, what is your platform, and how are you performing on that platform with regards to the rest of the people on that platform. And I think uh, this is an area which tremendous work has been done. Uh, I, in this area, my sincere appreciation really goes to the, uh, uh, the implementing partners who have supported a lot of the commercial uh, uh, EQA material that are used by these labs. And as a result, improve and strengthen the number of tests that are actually being accredited, uh, whether it's proficiency testing uh, for TB, uh, blinded rechecking, or visual evaluation. Uh, those are things that uh, have taken the labs far. This is a really uh, important slide because it actually shows where the labs actually begun and how they've actually progressed to get to where they are at this point. It's easy to talk about uh, having 97.5% uh, when they got accredited, but tremendous work has been done by these labs and a lot of respect goes out to the people who do this. Uh, who are working at these labs and the work they do to help the patients and the clinical officers that are taking care of these patients. And now uh, it's become the norm. It's become the norms for labs to, to, to scramble to tell you that they had 100% at their last EQA. Uh, it almost defies the fact that you ask because when you ask, the, the first thing the flunk at you is, oh, we had 100%, you want to see? Yes, we want to see. Uh, but this is what has happened. You look at uh, the SLAMTA labs again, because they're part of all the, the journey, 85% of them 
are performing satisfactorily, which means they have scores that are accepted by the uh, uh, panel providers. And 96% of the accredited labs are as well performing satisfactorily. Excellent quality assessment, which is the whole EQA. There are two very important things that uh, this whole exercise supporting laboratory strengthening in Uganda has actually brought under this. And the two is, what does EQA do for the facility? Basically, EQA within the facility, and this is the reason why we strongly encourage uh, the implementing partners to continue to support EQA systems uh, in all their labs. It allows the labs to evaluate and it allows them to be able to identify places for trainings, uh, places for improvement. It is huge within the facility. But from a public health perspective, from a public health perspective, when today you talk about uh, decentralization of uh, testing in Uganda, and you talk about 37 plus labs accredited in Uganda, from a public health perspective, EKA allows for results, for assurance within the results when you're talking about surveillance activities. So we know instantly that all the laboratories that are participating in EQA, there is a minimum performance that they're going to have, which allows uh, our Ministry of Health and all the people involved uh, in the public health uh, frontline prevention to be able to, to move fast. Waste management was another area that we had uh, to work in. Uh, basically, uh, at the beginning, the three important documents existed the ISO 15190, the uh, WHO Biosafety Manual, and the uh, CWA 15793. Basically, what we did from the foundation was we brought in the bio risk uh, management, ISO 35001, incorporated it into this, uh, used it, uh, developed a checklist, developed a policy manual, assessed 108 laboratories across the country. You can see with the dots. Uh, strengthened uh, 25 national bio-risk auditors that were trained and able to go out to the field. And this is basically what it said in terms of waste management in the country and bio-risk exposure. Between high and very high, you see the percentages are themselves high. Moderate, low, and very low. Those numbers are very small. But this is the, the story behind them. When you look from the management requirements and management understanding, what you actually see is there were two things, a performance evaluation and improvement were very low. Management gave very little attention to those areas. And if management is not doing performance evaluation or looking at improvements, then of course the risk levels stay high. Of course, management gave support. Yes, you go to every lab, there are black bags, there are yellow bags and there are red bags. Uh, there was leadership because now all the labs have uh, a safety officer or a logistics officer. But then we need a complete understanding and grounding of all the management uh, requirements to be able to understand us. Again, in the background to, the, uh, to what you see here, again, to the background to what you see here, you look at uh, the two bars that I have here, the 70 and 68 are all in black. Those bars performed well because those two elements are actually externally supported. If you look at transport of samples that manage by the most part by the uh, implementing partners, waste disposal, there's an outside caterer for that. Now, when you look at what is actually within the hands and the realm of the lab, then you actually begin to see that they are struggling. And so that is important in recognizing as we want to build the waste management uh, and the bio-risk management uh, efforts. Hoima went uh, more than an extra mile. They have, uh, and I really had to show this picture for Hoima, and they went, they really went far. They have a whole building that is put up uh, for the different levels. The doors are color coded. You can't miss them. Uh, even if you were TV Wanda, you would still be able to see them. Uh, and then the impact. 25 national bio-risk auditors were trained. Uh, so there are enough auditors to be able to now accentuate the need for bio-risk management in the country. Uh, by 20 national bio-risk trainers have been put out. Laboratory waste management policy, which is one of the standards we looked at, uh, yet to be uh, implemented.
I stop because I want you to appreciate the slide. I don't want to tell you anything. This is for us is a big achievement for all the things uh, that was done. Today, 11 million citizens and residents of Uganda have access to an accredited laboratory. In the year 2020, in spite of COVID, 1.2 million tests were done across these laboratories, which means everybody who had access actually had a test and a half done. And I think this is phenomenal and this speaks volumes and uh, uh, my thanks really go to CDC for providing the funding for this work to be done and to UNHLS and the Ministry of Health for allowing us to be able to get into these laboratories. 11.7 million people have access to proper quality diagnostic uh, testing and already 1.2 million people have actually been able to, uh, to use these facilities and have had tests done at their facility. COVID broke uh, March 2020. And just before COVID broke uh, at the Global Healthcare, we had already started developing a platform because we're moving into the next level of initiative and how do we get the work done without the expenses of moving people, the residencies and all of that. We just finished developing a great platform uh, which allows us to train, allows us to carry out mentorships, uh, allows us to do audit. If you look to the picture on your, on your left, it's actually an assessment with the SANAS team. And the, the picture to your right is actually the, the laboratory responding to questions in real time, uh, going through an assessment. Uh, we were actually able, SANAS, this is really important to note, SANAS did its first remote assessment in collaboration with a global healthcare and the Ministry of Health by OD, uh, assessing laboratories in Uganda. It was through this experience that they were able to cascade, and I hope the Sanas people are listening to this, they were able to cascade their online and remote audits to be go online. And we've had uh, a number of the labs go through their surveillance using the uh, remote assessment. And the platform we developed has been phenomenal in allowing them to be able to do this and allowing us to be able to train them and make them ready. So when you say all the things I've said, how do you manage to say that you had a challenge? When you say all the things I've said, it's so hard to say you had a challenge. But yes, we did have, and it was a very simple challenge. It was a mind shift challenge. In 2016, everything that I said had already happened in Uganda from the inception of the Ministry of Health. Uh, all these things already existed. And so it was a big mind shift to start moving people to move business as usual into a quality culture. That was heavy lifting. Today, it has now become a part of the norm. It has truly been, I went into a facility and the quality officer said to me, in the morning when I get up, the way I dress has to translate to people, I am the quality officer. That's a huge change. That's a dramatic change from when we first started. How do I say thank you? How do I say thank you? The Honorable Minister, Dr. Jane Rutha Chen, uh, I first met her when she was DG. We've had a phenomenal working relationship. Uh, Dr. Diana Twini, I've been on the field with you looking at the facilities and seeing the state in which they are. I don't know how many times I've been on the phone with uh, Dr. Nabada, uh, late in the night, early in the morning, uh, meetings in the office uh, to discuss how we continue to move the project. Uh, I could not say thank you enough. Uh, Mr. Patrick Ogwok, uh, Director of the Quality Management Systems out at the UNHLS, thank you tremendously for your support. And uh, as much as I would like to thank everybody, there is no way I cannot thank uh, Ma Bakunda. I choose to call her Ma Bakunda from my Botswana knowledge, uh, who is the training coordinator without whom all the people we've trained almost 2,000 plus people that have been trained would not have happened without your support, Bakunda. I thank you tremendously. There are many other people out at UNHLS and the ministry who I should be saying thank you to. Uh, my sincere appreciation to all of you, uh, even the data clerks for helping us send out mails to the different labs, the different regional directors to invite them for activities. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, and then of course, 
to the people who held the money bag, uh, I thank you tremendously for having selected us in the first place. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much indeed. We've had some very great conversations. Uh, to my PO, uh, my current PO, Dr. Christina Mwangi, uh, I have known her for a while, but your leadership style is tremendous. I thank you for your leadership. I thank you for your great understanding of the application of this work and helping us to do the things that we've been able to do and steer us in the right direction. Dr. Dona Kabatesi, I know you were a PO at some point, and I really miss those conversations we used to have. They were different. They actually used to steer us in a different direction, but they were very nice to have. And I thank you so much for the time uh, that you gave coming over to our offices and having to have those discussions. Uh, Peter, Jackie, the finance people, oh my God, oh my God. I love you and I hate you, I love you. <laughs> All the things we had to respond to, it was great. It was such fun working with you. It was such fun working with you. Uh, Mary, Mary, thank you so much uh, for your stewardship and your advice with those very early morning calls. I'm on the road sitting in traffic and I'm looking for somebody to talk to. And I'm like, why don't I just call Mary? Mary, thank you so much indeed. I sincerely appreciate uh, the CDC team at large for all the support we've gotten and uh, what it has done to us as a Global Healthcare Public Foundation and to the country uh, in terms of strengthening lab systems in Uganda. Uh, there are many other people to be known, acknowledged uh, USAID partners we work with, uh, DOD, uh, the regional and district leadership, uh, the DLFPs, of course, the facility people, it's you who did this, it's you, all the credit goes to you, it's you and the facility that had to do the grind. Uh, we just had to do the talking and look nice. Uh, implementing partners, we had a great collaboration with you as an oversight mechanism. It was really wonderful working with a lot of our, all our implementing partners on the ground who were directly involved. Uh, the lab managers, lab staff, all the stakeholders, uh, our sincere appreciation and thanks. But most of all, most of all, most of all, to the team right here at the Global Healthcare Public Foundation, uh, this is the smiling faces when they wear the official t-shirt. And this is how they look like when they are planning to wear the official t-shirt. I thank you so very much indeed. We are greatly indebted to you. I know you're being blessed by many people all over the world and all over this country for a phenomenal job well done. I join in saying thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I never want to end any of my presentations because we're still in the COVID days without telling you, please stay safe. Wash your hands, 20 seconds or more, please. Take your temperature, sanitize. And it doesn't matter whether you've had the vaccine or not, please continue to wear a face mask, social distance. Thank you.